great. Here we go. Hi, I'm John Dutton, and this is Spilled Ink. It is March, uh, and it's beautiful outside. I can't wait to hear everybody speak. Um, looking forward to it. We have uh, 18 people tonight so far, and I know others are going to be rolling in, so it's going to be a good night. So um, I love baseball. Some of you might have seen my little post. It's been um, baseball started for my son and daughter she plays softball and jack plays baseball and brooke had a practice on a beautiful beautiful day last week and i was walking outside and i took the dog and i was like all right and we took a lap around the field like three or four times and i i, I started to think of baseball so this was my baseball poem i know where baseballs die Turn right at the fair pole where the grass grows high. Under the towering light poles behind the old rusted fence, lost in the thick forest of weeds so dense. Across the natural moat where your sneakers start to squish. Spools of yarn, rawhide covers, red stitches fading away under the sun, planted by the boys of summer having such fun. And that was where I know where baseballs die. Nice. Lovely. Thank you. And then I we did a Fraxis in this week. Okay. And uh, I, I really liked it. It was uh, somebody gave me the picture and um, it was, and I, 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 I actually gave a lesson about um, graffiti versus street art. Okay. And it was, this was street art. It was so, it should have been in a museum. It was, this, it was a picture of a homeless man floating up in the air with an, a ragged coat on and one shoe off and one shoe on. And it was just stunningly beautiful. And the so I gave them, and I will use this in a novel. Uh, I love the, the title of it. The person who gave it to me said, we call it Alley Floater. And I was like, ooh, that sounds like a perfect name I have Brian Donald James giving me the tear collector for my next murder mystery last time. Now I have Allie Floater for maybe my lead detective. Then she'll he'll just he'll uh, he'll meet up with or she'll meet up with with Beverly Ann Van Decky sleuth. And by gosh, we'll just get it rolling and we'll include all these spilled anchors. So it'd be great. All right. So this is Allie Floater, and uh, it goes along with the Ophraxis. It happened long ago when I first started making up stories. I would always like to see how many people I could fool into believing them, me. I could always fool my parents, but my grandfather, huh, he would always say, you're full of hot air, kid. I never believed him, but it was true. I told so many stories because, and I became so full of hot air, I soon began to float. At first, it happened once or twice a month. However, the more stories I told, the more I floated. Now I have told so many stories, I float forever. I have not touched the ground in over 10 years. I have even tried telling the truth, but that did not work. I am now stuck. So I want to warn you, don't tell stories. Always tell the truth. Yeah. And that's Allie Floater. And those were mine for this month. All right, thank you all. Migration of the heart. Out of the gray mornings where clouds lie against the water, low bellies of infinite plainness, the dark line of horizon is erased, leaving only forever to hold the clouds of our breath. The mitten palm, swallowed by my big black gloves, trembled against the quiet cold. Child of mine, deep in the wings, these feathers of coruscating color, describing turn, mallard, snow geese, resting on the glass lake, rushing suddenly, tiny gales of energy becoming part of the sky, turns to me in a moment of wonder, how do they know where they are going if they've never been there before? I wrap my arms across my chest. He leans back against the envelope of flesh, holding me to the earth. The same way you know which colors are hot 
and which ones are cool. The same way your laughter makes the color of my love a rainbow. Now, the next one is first dandelion afternoon. Let me get this where I can see it, yeah. We were on the hillside of our romance, caught in the straw chewing philosophies that drew deep arguments about the shapes formed by clouds. Knew the gods demand the proper interpretations of secrets sent draped across the landscapes of heavens. I had chased, walked, talked you out of a cloistered tomb of winter demands where the heat smothered pushed you into a pillow's wallpaper and the constant racket TV fills the silence with limitless promise undelivered. First spring days are sacred. Wishes sent to the clouds by elfin winds draped on the backs of dandelion ballerinas become secrets released on the cusp a warm day's passion freed in the flutter of flight, quail flushed. We fell on our backs after rock dancing across stream, dividing the valley, masters of the world, a quilt spread before us. You decreed that work should cease, maypoles woven in the early March, brownies invited to attend in crocus bonnets, the twinkle of your eyes as you pushed your hands into the pockets of low slung jeans. Summer would not leap into my arms soon enough. We held hands as we commented on the clouds display, felt brave as we trembled with the rising fog of desire, rose to our feet, tossed Dandy's lions aside and raced across the fields as if we could outdistance the first signs of love awoken before we knew what it meant. And then my last one, <clears throat> another little simple one called Times of Day. <clears throat> you can see why I earned all this white hair. <laughs> Number one, I heard you before your shadow laid its head upon my heart. A wind held its breath. The first light broke the silence I heard, exhaled, a breeze. The starlings clattered out of the trees, a rush of busybodies hot with gossip. Two, before we, apes, placed our feet upon the hard ground, stopped roaming branches, we must have dreamed flight would come. We would be leaved with feathers, a kaleidoscope of colors, we would swirl around each other above treetops, haunting lifetimes, the moment we were birds. Three, when darkness was a taste, your eyes were a fire and my tongue was raw. The moon danced on the froth, you stood on the crest of a dune, the wind holding onto your clothes, you looked as if you could step off into the sky Stroll among the stars, savor the flavors, eternity tied in your hair. Four, the house, when the house is empty, I sit in the garden, hear you in the wind, find you, blossoms erupt. End poem. I'm back. And I got three new poems. I hope you guys love it. It's called, the first one is called Creation. Feeling expired, making sudden change. It's on your resume, prepared to arrange. Lying on the couch, counting the rotation of the ceiling fan going to a fast motion. Right hand is my notebook. The other is my pen. Scribble on and on. So let's begin. Create. That was creation. Next one 
Lemon. Bitterness has been surrounded me by sour, timid, and stinging pain. Dealing with the mind-numbing submission of bitterness. It is difficult to balance the bitterness defeats. Functionally, there's a cure of this. A cool, clear, and refreshing oasis in unlimited sweet lives. That's lemon. And my last one is called The Great Might. I might fall. Will you pick me up? I might call. Will you answer it? I might stay. Do you want to talk? I might leave. Do you want to take a walk? I might be there just for a minute or so. I might take care. Send me a message. All those visions of out of sight, I'll grab it with all my might. That's and that's it. Thank you. I was looking around for what to read tonight and I sort of spiraled by this one. And, you know, I thought with everything going on, this might be a good one to share. Um, this is to Roland. Um, Roland was my ninth grade English teacher when I first moved down to Texas. Come on, bud, no. And the cat's getting in the way, of course. So this is to Roland. Do you remember? A man stands alone in the cold. Walls of ice loom in the dimness. Silence cold like a hunter. Man turns at a sound heard. Only a shimmer of ice like silver water slithers silence. Ice walls move in, closing the silence on the lone man. Do you remember the tall, painfully skinny, painfully shy Yankee immigrant in one of your ninth grade English classes? You know, the girl who, when you assigned the class to write an ending for the lady of the tiger or the tiger, found the words to choose the tiger. The words of this poem are merely reflections of those words I found listening to your crystalline aggressive music. After the first tentative, lone man a shimmer of ice, silver water slithers silence, I found a language that feeds me, hurts me, kills me, lives me, heals me, saves me. Truly, I have been speechless only in saying thank you. Um, the sort of epigraph at the beginning is actually one of the first poems I ever wrote in his class. The next one is it's springtime and hopefully we're all gonna be getting out and doing some great things. So this is an old one but I think it still has some uh, good potential. If poets held fundraisers. It's a sunny Saturday in late spring and you're running errands. You see the hand lettered sign held by the black dressed man with the cool shades. It reads car wash, poetry slam fundraiser, help send our local poets to national finals in August. So curiosity peaked, you turn into the soap soap parking lot and there are the poets, hoses, buckets, sponges at the ready. Well, what did you think we would look like? Yes, we could be any of a dozen or so people picked at random from shopping malls, movies, fast food joints, except we are people powered by words. And this car wash is an experience, in quotes, where cars are stylistically soaked with sonnets and sestinas and rinsed with rhyme, rubbed down with iambic pentameter. Your car gets a, a final polish of free verse with a touch of high cue. And you make your contribution to the cause. 
and you're thinking, will it sing in Chicago? You're ushered back onto the road to the beat of bebop jazz poetry, and there is no doubt in your mind, poetry is alive. And you wonder if, but the words slip away for lack of a pencil. And, um, you know, for the past year, I've been tuning in weeknights to Billy Collins and his poetry broadcast. <clears throat> and there's some incredible talk about poetry and, uh, you know, other, and he shares other folks as well as reading his own. And it's been great. He's taking a break now and he will not be coming. He'll be coming back twice a week. Um, and then he's going to be doing the Poetry Driver or something like that in June, which is like a three hour session, just kind of like a mini master class. So if you go to Billy Collins website, it'll have that link in it that does cost money because it's his college is doing a fundraiser and it's paying, but so while I was listening to this, I kind of got distracted. So it's just now. Bars of light across your face as you perform an audit of Amon's sensorium until I am distracted by my tuxedo wearing cat attempting to unplug lamps with burned out bulbs that allow the book mask of mystic hideaways to fade to monochrome in the shadow of the sideboard that doesn't care whether the poem focuses on the duck or the rabbit. That's it. Uh, one of my favorite poems is uh, the light to read a sweet song, to, somber tones about a jazz player uh, playing the horn. Uh, but also during that time when I was a teenager, I had all these jazz players come visiting me in my dreams and things of this nature. And um, one night I stumbled across one, he was a, a guitar player. So I'll share this one piece uh, this evening. It's called Willie T and the Young Tender. I first want to say, I love you too, sweet thing. And cause I cares for you. I need to explain something to you. See now, this thing called loving, well, it's got degrees and levels to it. Let me explain about a woman I have loved before, a good woman. Love her since she was in pigtails and barrettes till she grown. See, we's friends, right? We's lovers. I wake up in the morning to work in the fields while she take care of other folks' kids for a bit of money. I gives her all my earnings we try to make a happy home. But I ain't really happy cause the Lord gave me a gift to sing and rhyme, you know how Willie do. And if you're blessed with this here type of talent, well, you ain't complete unless you're performing. And I ain't mean to hurt her, but I turns cold. If she starts crying for no reason at night cause she knew she weren't enough. And when she got tired of the heartache I give her, she up and left me and got a city slicker. But I ain't blame her, cause ain't no gal need to be treated that way. I mean, we's friends, we's lovers, right? Okay now, so Willie just sat down with that hurt, wrote that dad tune called I Loves a Woman, better than any of that tired old songs I was singing on the chicken circuit before. And you know the rest, all the fame Willie T can handle. Still an old man likes the sweetness and smile of a young tender. And you like the wisdom and charm that really provide. See, I ain't no young huckabuck ask you whose is it? Cause I already know. I make loves beyond the flesh. A late night melody of sounds beyond me plucking these here strings. And you knew it the first time you saw it, me at my show. I make your body call for me. I know you heard it. Cause you're lying here right now beside me. Mm-hmm. But darling, nah. Willie can't be your man. Have you chasing ghosts of my past loves when you ain't even lived yet? Nah, let me be that lovely poem that slips from your mind from time to time. Let me be that sweet piece of penny candy that fade. I do love you, young tender. 
God, you put the wink in my eye, but I ain't going to steal your life. No, sugar. Now go over there, fetch me my guitar. Let me play you a song. Let me sing of affection. Let me make a memory of love to hold close to your heart, and you go on and live your life. That is, until Willie come back in town. Thank you. I'm not sure if I read this poem before here or not, but I was going through receipts yesterday and I came across a receipt from last year, which was the, um, the physical reminder of going to a restaurant right before the pandemic started in earnest last year. And I wrote a poem at that time um, based on what I knew at the time about, about the coronavirus and so forth. And um, I had gone to a particular restaurant and I had, um, I had an experience where um, there seemed to be some irony in the situation. And that's where the poem uh, comes from. And it's called, uh, it's called How We Panda. Let me pull it up here. How We Panda. And it has an epigraph at the beginning. We have your cravings covered. Slogan, Panda Express, Chinese Kitchen. I hope good fortune awaits when I enter Panda Express to cure my hunger pangs on this early March evening before all the 2020 hindsight hype hits our relentless news cycles. After a few weeks of drastic changes that start as soon as spring comes. So I, with an ungloved hand, already wary, touch only a door handle's barest edge, careful to, to avoid contamination, protect myself as much as possible. As I go in, I am surprised. It's this busy that I find myself in a mostly silent single file line, a dozen distracted customers deep, updating themselves by scrolling through smartphone screens. Not a face mask in sight yet. Even as a no longer novel contagion rages, ravages the world's citizen cells and people everywhere struggle to breathe free air. While I wait in the oh, oh so slow queue, I consider its irony as I shuffle along my best foot forward. Another dozen victims fall in behind me doubtless salivating as I am from the succulent scent surrounding us as a familiar fragrant flavor infects our noses. I recall reports say a few droplets is all it takes to transmit. We pass away time as does the, comp the company's repeating video commercial. I notice playing within flat lines of a monitor mounted in plain view on the opposite great wall, promoting the restaurant explaining how to order, how to panda. But what used to be an age old asset, an exotic enticement to attract more business, a once unique selling point appears to have developed into a recent liability. All of our entrees recipes originate from provinces in mainland China. Strength exposed as weakness, a positive trait turned into a negative, exploited as a disadvantage used against us. Similar to how SARS-CoV-2 affects humans, out of somewhere a previously unknown new strain of contagious coronavirus germinated in a Wuhan wet market of live animals and seafood about three months ago, began to travel the globe in and on its carriers, proceeded to make a royal mess of human existence. And then as it spread, began to push people to the brink of extinction. Maybe it was manufactured in a secret lab, as the rumors say. Maybe the animals have had enough, decided to get their revenge. Our nature is finally fighting back to save itself before it's too late. 
either way, we know now what it feels like to be seriously threatened an endangered species with little control over its continued survival at the mercy of an apathetic killer who does not discriminate. Today's news details startling statistics, shocking totals that will seem mild in comparison as they increase daily, more than 102,000 cases planet-wide. The coronavirus caused disease, COVID-19's death toll is over 3,400 people, already more fatalities than 9-11's attacks. It has grown into a full-blown pandemic, crowning the world with communicable misery and mass hysteria, not just the flu. But despite these alarming numbers, we can't take it seriously. It seems we create memes, tell jokes, nervously laugh it off instead, yet make no effort to break out of our selfish, self-destructive habits. Because here is where and how we panda in America amid panic. As gluttonous, we gaze with want at glistening cuts of meat, mounds of blooming, gleaming noodles, fried rice, and mixed veggies. Their wok-seared wok sheen glares back behind glass shields while we retreat out of range of sneezes and fear or give the side eye to anyone in the room who coughs or wheezes a little funny. We may be worried, yet we can't wait to eat it. Still stubborn, not concerned enough to not scarf down this scrumptious American Chinese food. Although the juxtaposition may be hard to swallow, it feels strange or wrong somehow to consume it now, given the alleged origin of this pervasive modern plague. Later, full of it, I'll throw out an empty container, its clamshell lid closed on a styrofoam coffin, and wonder and ponder my fellow patrons' fates, curious about whether those last meals they ate were anywhere as close to being as delicious and satisfying a guilty pleasure as mine was. So tasty, but I wonder if they have any leftovers to savor. Will they ever be able to finish them? I know I may never know. As the pandemonium grows, I hope good fortune awaits. So I had emailed you or something that um, it, it would be okay with me if everybody unmutes because this is I need I need laughter, and um, I can laugh. After that. <laughs> so anyway, here it goes. Um, Bob as some of you might know, is my ex from years ago. So I wrote this a few years ago while we were still together, so here. Okay, it's called Bob and His Little Bobs. Bob is a very nice man, but sometimes he gets himself into situations where one must wonder how they came to be. My daughter and I have wondered what the thought processes are that bring about these awkward situations. Are there any thought processes? <laughs> I concluded that he has little Bob sitting on his shoulders, giving him good and bad advice. I have further analyzed the problem and have determined exactly what happens in the mind of Bob. One sometimes sees on TV or in comics perched on our hero's shoulder, an angel and, and, and devil or a good, bad, good and bad version of himself. The same two always appear. Well, Bob's world works a bit differently. There are many little Bobs. The little Bobs all live in the same space inside his head, but they're divided into two camps, the good Bobs and the bad Bobs. The good Bobs, sometimes called the GBs, try to save him from embarrassment, ridicule, or physical harm. The bad Bobs, or BBs, aren't really bad because Bob is not bad or evil. They just try to make him do dumb things. Each little Bob has a cape and scanty outfit, much like regular superhero, much like a regular superhero. However, each has a different letter on his chest, which indicates his specific role. The GBs and BBs get along okay, except when they sense that Bob could use a little, pardon the pun, help thinking things through. They spring into action, one side to save him from himself, the other to wreak a bit of havoc and give people ammunition for some time to come. They don't just chaotically appear on his shoulder, though. 
they abide by certain rules. As they sense Bob considering an interesting object or idea, members of each camp hold a meeting to discuss the impending situation, decide who best to represent their side in the matter, and send him down to their side of Bob's shoulders. Only two at a time, one from each camp, can arrive at any one time, and they must get there simultaneously. To accomplish this, they meet at a transporter between the camps and beam down together. Of course, as this is a human mind in action, the timing of all this is incredibly fast, and who speaks first depends on how Bob has approached the situation. If a bystander happens to notice Bob, he would witness a potential disaster. Let's look at some examples of little Bob that work. Bag of chips. The chips were all gone, and there was nothing left but crumbs in the bottom of the bag. Why waste any of this great snack? I'll just tip it up. The little Bob camp sent down grown up Bob and kid Bob. Grown up. You'll get crumbs all over your face and you might sneeze and make it worse. You probably won't even get all the crumbs off your face. So you go around for the rest of the day and nobody will tell you about the crumbs stuck in your eyebrows. <laughs> Don't you wonder if you can get every last little crumb out of that bag? He got all the crumbs out all right, but some didn't make it into his mouth. Your time, my time. There was a time when few people had cell phones and digital clocks, so we relied on landlines, AKA home phones, and actual clocks with hands at the bedside and on our kitchen walls and stoves. One weekend, the four of us were going camping and we always took my pickup and Bob's car. I had packed the truck, but Bob and Trina, who were about 15 miles away, were running late, so I decided to call. Bob was still in bed when his phone rang. First ring. Bob opening one eye. Crap, that must be Gail. The little Bob scrambled down before the second ring. Responsible Bob. Don't answer that yet. Maybe Gail will say something dumb first. Second ring. Irresponsible Bob. You're barely awake, so just go with the first thing that comes out. I'm sure it will also be dumb. Gail, irritating, where are you? Responsible Bob, I was right. Bob, I'm here, what time is it up there? Irresponsible Bob, we were both right. Attack of the reindeers. It was near Christmas and we liked to shop at out of area stores. We were all in a Dollar General type store that was crowded with customers and Christmas gifts and decorations. It was hard to maneuver our shopping carts amongst the people and wares. At one point, Bob abandoned his cart after being attracted by a display of delicately balanced, unboxed reindeers. Don't do it, Bob, AKA DDI, and yes, do it, Bob, YDI, rushed to their positions on Bob's shoulders. DDI, I don't know how they expect a customer to get one of these things off the display. The hoofs and horns are all tangled together and it's precarious and maybe dangerous if it collapses onto you. YDI, you've never played Jenga, but I know you can successfully keep the tower from collapsing if you remove the right block. Of course, this is very different, but the principle is the same. Let's see, DDI, no, no, oh. Bob said he barely touched the display. We <laughs> and a bunch of other folks witnessed him frantically fighting off the reindeers as they collapsed onto him. <laughs> Carnival frog game. We ran across a carnival game where you had to launch a rubber frog onto a floating lily pad. When we stopped to try it, the little Bobs went to work. Stay Real Bob's mission was to save our hero from himself. Show him how smart you are, Bob's, AKA Delusional Bob or D-Bob. Mission was to urge him on. D-Bob. This, this is another chance to show them how smart you are, even though you're not as smart as you think. But they don't know that, do they? You can wow them by explaining your analysis of how this will be accomplished. Like, if you hit the frog just so, the XY axis on the space-time continuum will cause the frog to travel at such an angle and velocity that it will land on your intended lily pad. Gail will be so proud of you and, and you'll win her a prize. Stay real. You haven't learned that you don't know everything and they'll know you don't know what you're talking about. You've never even played the game, so don't listen to D-Bob. Unfortunately for Bob, D-Bob won that round. He launched the frog about 
five inches when he needed about five feet. Obviously, he didn't earn a prize, but for years thereafter, whenever we played carnival games, he earned our satirical imitations of his ridiculous theory. The bucket. We were all in a Dollar General store and Bob was waiting for us outside when, when a stack of metal buckets caught his attention. He started to wonder about the capacity of one of those buckets. One cubic foot, perhaps? The little Bob <laughs> sprang into action. Professor Bob came down from the BBs and reality Bob from the GBs. Professor, <laughs> I bet I can prove the size of that bucket is one cubic foot. They don't call it that for nothing. My foot is probably just under that and should slip in and out. Then I can tell everybody the capacity of these buckets and they'll see how smart I am. Yeah. <laughs> You're gonna get your foot stuck in that bucket and everyone will see you. <laughs> when we came out, we found him frantically trying to free his foot before anyone <laughs> saw him. Thereafter, one of his many nicknames was Bucket Man. Okay, that's it. <laughs> First of all, it's so good to be here. I haven't done any of the virtual ones. The last one I did um, was in the coffee shop. So it's so good uh, to be back with you guys. And um, I'm going to read just a very short blog post from uh, my website. My website is something that I finally accomplished during this pandemic. It took forever. So um, I have a series of blogs about uh, mainly about the writing life. And so everything that I post has something to do with sort of what it means to write. And uh, so this one is um, titled um, A Walking Marriage. And just for the record, my husband's name is not Bob. <laughs> just want to make that clear. OK. Um, Ours is a walking marriage. After 13 years, my husband and I have figured out the secret to a happy marriage, walking. We walk to see how far we can get. It's our exercise as we work toward our 12,000 steps each day. Okay, maybe more like 10. It's our financial planning and our meal planning time. It's our time for political discussions. And given our political polarity, it gives me an out as I can just walk or stomp away when his comments become too partisan. Uh, we have uh, fought on our walks and we have also made up on our walks. And finally, it's our method of coping with the isolation of the pandemic. On these walks, we've confessed our weaknesses and bolstered each other up against them. We've bemoaned our aches and pains and encouraged each other past them. We've discussed the sad state of our sidewalks and the rude or distracted drivers that pass us by. We've remarked on the wide blue sky and the scant acorns waiting for us to walk directly beneath before dropping. These walks are as essential to my writing life as it is to our marriage. We sometimes reach a comfortable silence. It's my thinking time when I am solving character issues or plot points or working on the questions of life. Why are we here? Does God love us? Why do people have to suffer? Once when I imagined my husband pondering the same, I asked him, what was he thinking? His response was much less existential. He said, I was just wondering what the $6 million man would be worth in today's dollars. I laughed for a couple of blocks. There's another couple we often see on our walks. We've named them Harold and Marge. My husband gets a kick out of the fact that Marge is always out walking Harold. She's done it again, left poor Harold in the dust, he'll say. And then we worry whenever we see Harold walking alone. When I asked my husband to dream with me a bit about what life might still have in store for us, he'll describe how he would love to drive his truck in the wrong direction down Church Street in Manassas at 3 a.m. on any given Saturday just to see how far he can get. I didn't say my husband was sane and he might have some bobs on his shoulder. <laughs> on the weekends, we extend our walks and find our way into Old Town where we admire the architecture and debate landscaping decisions or choose which house we'd snatch up should it ever come on the market. We stop for coffee or for trinkets or conversation or just, just to support the local shops. 
Ours is a walking marriage. This is our time together. It's our thing. As we amble on, we are silently aware of how grateful we are for each other, our blessings, our laughs, our annoyances, our quirks, our ability to just walk together and the privilege of sharing this life together, just to see how far we can get. Thanks. So I'll be reading a poem called Time Out that I wrote in 1989. This is way, way before COVID, so I think you'll be able to see the contrast. As we scampered to and fro, trying to keep pace with a busy world, many things go unattended, things that really matter most. No time to stop and pray a bit or to pause and reflect within. No time for family and friends to gather and just to savor being together. Before too long though, time will pass and we'll be astounded by our loss. Cause try as we might, we can never recover. The past is past, gone forever. This is a story I've never done here. It's called The Very Great Antarctica Trek. The place was Antarctica. George Shearhar and Greg Galman were about to embark on a great journey. The great, the very great Antarctica trek. The winds were frigid and strong. The ground was hard ice. No matter the conditions, they were determined to go on this trek. They were at the starting point. Crowds of people were gathered around cheering them on. George and Greg were bundled up from head to toe. They put on their backpacks full of gear and food. Then the time came. It was the time to begin the very great Antarctica trek. The crowds cheered as they took their first steps but then everything was silent. Everyone was in great awe. They were astonished at what they were seeing. George and Greg, who were determined not to stop on this great trek until they reached the very end and came to a stop. They watched as a five foot four inch woman wearing a colorful dress walking barefoot walked up to them Excuse me, George was completely confused at what he was seeing. Do you realize it's frigid out here? You can freeze to death. Relax, said the woman. I'm only here to wish you a happy Palm Sunday. Oh, said George. Happy Palm Sunday to you. Have a nice trek, she shivered. I must go get warm now. She ran away to get warm. George and Greg continued on their trek and they did complete it. And that is the very great Antarctica trek. And now, of course, if you, some of you may have already figured out, this is Palm Sunday weekend. And this piece is titled Happy Palm Sunday. Chef Francois Paris baked hamburger buns in the shape of palm trees. On that day, we celebrated Happy Palm Bun Day. Harry Luck needed to get 5,000 palm trees planted in order to get paid. After a long period of time, he got the job done. On that day, we celebrated Happy Palm Done Day. On the one day at a tropical beach, everyone was bored. Bibbo the Clown was brought in to make everything fun. On that day, we celebrated Happy Palm Fun Day. Billy Botts got a new gun for his birthday. On that day, we celebrated Happy Palm Gun Day. Wilbur bought his wife, Yvette, their own tro private tropical island. And on that day, they celebrated Happy Palm Hun Day. The local Catholic church treated all the nuns with a trip to a tropical island. And on that day, they celebrated Happy Palm 
Monday. Brian Cox was rewarded for telling a joke of the year. And they celebrated Happy Palm Pun Day. Dan Jackets ran 25 miles in 25 seconds in Palm Springs, California. And they celebrated Happy Palm Run Day after a 300 million game losing streak. The Galveston Palmies finally won a game against the Provo Storks. They celebrated Happy Palm One Day. And now that you all are here, I am going to celebrate. I am going to celebrate Thomas Burson, Robbie Krieger, Kim B. Miller, Beverly Ann, Leslie Tyson. John Dutton, Jim, Gail Williams, Denise, Sandy, Brian Donnell James, Andrew, Andrew, Michael, Paulette, Kimberly Ray, Alice, Morgan, Megan, Lucy, and Brittany. And we celebrate you on Happy Palm Sunday. And that is it. And I'm starting out with in awe of a rose. A rose was floating above me one morning when I awoke. The idea of a floating rose did not concern me. The why did not consume me. Instead, I regarded its beauty with the whole of my being. As it absorbed energy from my emotion, it grew. Time went away. Soon it was all I was aware of. I reached out and pulled back a petal, which was now three times my size. I slipped in behind it. Then I peeled back another petal and another until I was lost inside the rose. The scent was deafening. I discarded my nightwear, and so the satin velvet petals could caress my body. I closed my eyes and ran sensually through the flower. The bees brought me honey. The dew brought me water. I bathed in the rain. I can't remember having lived anywhere else. So that's an horrible rose. Uh, also, okay, this is the one I just wrote actually while we were sitting here, it's called Ghost Kitties. Our cat died last week. When I get in bed, I feel her behind me. I see her out of the corner of my eye from time to time. Yesterday, we got a new cat. When I let her out of the carrier, she rushed upstairs and hid. Food disappears. We catch a glimpse of her as she checks us out before running to hide again. Now we are haunted by two ghost cats. And I haven't done this one in a long time. So from Honolulu to Daytona Beach, they're throwing the clothes as far as they will reach all across the world, even their underwear, because everybody's partying bare. Do, 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 party naked. Stay at home and just be bored. Party naked. Give it up and climb on board. Party naked. Stripping down his own reward is the only fun we can still afford. Party naked. Party naked. Party naked. Do, 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 do. Lynn and Mike kicked off their boots and danced around the house in their birthday suits. Sarah Martin hid behind a TV guy, but she left as she watched Raw Hide. Our history teacher, Miss Cindy McCall, spun on her back in the all in all. When our honored mayor decided to strip, he displayed his great statesmanship. Party naked, now's the time you can only win. Party naked. Run around in your best skin, party naked. Before you know it, you wear a grin. All this fun ought to be a sin. 
party naked, party naked, party naked. Do, 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 do. One of the neighbors called the police to complain. He claimed that all of us had gone insane. Turns out the local tailor had made the report. Oh, he's so traveled to nude resorts. Reverend Jim came by to pay a call. Five minutes later, he was on at your row. Elsie Smith, oldest woman in town, stripped out of her nightgown. Do, 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 party naked. Take off your clothes, show style and flair. Party naked, without a stitch or without a care. Party naked, makes you feel like a millionaire. Even your private parts need some air. Party naked, party naked, party naked. Do, 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 do. Fireman Fred took off his clothes. Then a little bit later, he showed off his hose. Chief Detective Jimmy, who was mean and tough, smiled as he stripped to the bump. Judge Julia Faber began to disrobe when she heard they were doing it across the globe. Miss Carol Wright, who runs a factory, said she never felt so free. Do, 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 party naked, take off your clothes and make you glad. Party naked, moving down with rat was about unclad. Party naked, doing a peel as late as bad. It's the best time you will ever have. Party naked, party naked, party naked. Do, 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 do. That's it. Hey, everybody. Um, I'm Robbie Krieger. That's my real name. I have two other uh, like stage names, uh, Rise, uh, like Sunrise, and uh, Jack Patch, which, which is like my Western poetic name. Uh, I'm trying to publish this collection of poems, uh, kind of going through the editorial process. So I'm just trying to be patient. And uh, I, um, I'm gonna read three pages of my epic Appalachian Trail poem. Uh, I, I threw Hike the AT in 2015, kind of on and off with a friend. And, uh, and so we're in Southern Virginia and, uh, and uh, here goes, I'm just gonna read it out to you. Um, I'm going to put my blog on here also, uh, the pages of jackpatch.blogspot.com. I haven't posted anything since January. I don't want to overdo it, but a lot of good nature and woodsy quotes from, you know, Thoreau, Whitman, Emerson, some local artists here. Um, so anyways, uh, this is about the Jefferson National Forest. Here goes. All right. <clears throat> Pelted by this purple night that was chilling our camp. The darkness was on display and the lightning was like a lamp, stunning me into a scare as the rain pulsed and poured on my tent by the tree there. Shaking it off with the sun, I spilled out of my sight, journeying on from Jenkins shelter, heading toward Helvey's mill. I didn't break for bland, rewind to that road, no need to hold out my hand. Huffing up this last hill, I made the 15 miles. When a sign to the side said shelter, I was all smiles. Hunkering down at Helby's mill, there was only two of us, South Africa and I, an older lady with the accent, she was not shy. This footpath has some fame, going around the globe, under an actual roof, we did pick and probe each other's experiences Safe from the remains of the storm, we cuddled with conversation, resting and warm. So trail names. Uh, drawn into the dawn, I reached for the ridge, battling on to Brushy Mountain, that, and then handling Lick Skillet Hollow. I stood at 600 miles with a future to follow. Passing under a power line, I did not grab anything at Trent's Grocery. But up ahead in the woodland to the west, away to the water was a walk blessed. With the foam of dismal falls flowing over stairs of stone, where I peeked from my perch at thoughts being thrown over this edge, crashing and bashing to the bottom as I looked from my ledge. At this sobering splash, no more toying with the top, as I slid down to the shore, pitching by the pool where these pages pour through the texture of my tent, rushing and gushing these descriptions to dent. 
Rising with the rhododendron, I wandered her pink and white bloom, laying under a laurel, reflecting in this room. Trace me to a tunnel, throbbing with thickness. Feel the foliage that saves us from a sickness, embedded in the suburbs, cities, everywhere. A succumbing to sadness, wheels working, the mechanics of madness. Depressed into our debts, we suffer in slog as the negative cast their nets. No, I will not stay a slave. Out in this expanse, there is no allegory of the cave. Graced by sugar run gap, I walk down to Woods Hole, sweetened by the sap of this 19th century log cabin where I found my father, delighted to spend a section with his son. This was good, I was glad. Hopefully he'll hold on, don't doubt your dad. That's all, thank you all so much for listening. The first poem I'm going to do is called Salt and Shovels. This one is something I came up with by doing a random subject generator. And I did two different subjects to give myself a choice. And then when it was Salt and Shovels, I challenged myself to write a piece using both of those subjects. From my hollow hallway, I shuffle, dragging feet so neighbors know I suffer. Snow shovel in hand, moving slowly over land, the attitude of a demanding child, chiding myself. I begin to delve into slick snow, slipping slightly as I strike each blow against the ice layer. I am the snow slayer. I spray salt, assaulting the pavement for making me leave my caved enslavement. My inner rage rips at my rib cage. Slight salt slides between glove fingers as a memory of you unwanted lingers. Salt again slides, not through my hands, but from my eyes. Every part of me tries to block the pain of those ties. You were my Sodom and Gomorrah. You turned me into a horrible person. We went from bad to worse. Not a relationship, but a living hearse. I cried so much, leaving for my good. I should have become a salt statue, only the desert knew. Like Lot's wife who ended her life, looking back at her ruiner, turning into earth elements sooner. I wish I could dig out all the reminders of when I lived with blinders. Shovel out all of you, gather the memories and spew dump it into a pile looking at a past I revile cover it in my salty tears and watch it melt years obliterating fears as my mental fog clears but time to go deeper no more the lone weeper excavate till I find the bones because I have been shown and finally own that I am grown if I live in rags it's because what I've sown Time to atone instead of the moan that I turn myself into a salt stone. With rosy cheeks and fingers numb, looking at how far I've come, more than a sidewalk was cleaned. My mind is now serene. I can survey my past like a movie scene and no longer demean myself or the memories of you. It was just something I had to go through. Now to focus on my dues, doing the work of growth for us both. Eyes forward facing futures, every past wound fixed with sutures, suitable suitors will be found once my healing is unbound, blessings will abound around, no longer uncrowned with head bowed down, like a flower bursting from the ground that astounds and leaves people spellbound with beauty and fragrance profound, not a ball, but watch me rebound from drowned and down to renowned and crowned. I won't live in an igloo of regret. Hardship is to life what salt is to sweat. Can remember the lesson but forget how it felt to live under the threat. Shovels are for snow, not to pile on painful blows. Each day is for the seizing. Living below freezing should only be for a season. Um, the second one is a little bit shorter. It's called long tables and I'd be interested to get feedback on what people think um, inspire this poem once I'm done with it.
in certain circles instead of cozy, instead of round tables, small and cozy, there are hollowed halls with long rectangular tables where only some sit in the high places and air seeking an air of seeking decadence, false deference, words that dance like ponies in new snow, binding the pedantic, quite tantric. Doors that swing shut with a heavy boom and only creak open slowly for those with the oil to drip on ancient hinges. Windows with locks and bars to bar bare, the bare hands that would grasp at opportunities when no place setting at the table could be found. Silver polished utensils replace the sparkle of new blood and bright futures. Traditions and customs used to dimly, to dimly lit by candlelight, what incandescent luminescence should have replaced. They scatter dinner crumbs for birds and watch them eat, feeling full and munificent. Magnanimous in their animus, seated in paltry thrones, speaking of duty and loyalty, while traitors to every servant not so servile. everybody's doing good. My name is Kim B. Miller. I'm the Poet Laureate for Prince William County, Virginia. And this poem is called Dress You. <clears throat> I was invisible. At least I thought I was. But apparently you can see me. I'm like a convenience store. You must have driven past me, but you didn't stop because I'm not convenient. I searched for you. So much so I learned to play hide and seek with my depression. There are no hiding spaces left. So I sit with my sadness. I wonder about you, a potential relationship. I was desperate to find you, but you play hide and seek better than me. Eventually, I stopped playing life and started living one. Now, here you come, out of the shadows. You expect this letter to do what? Strengthen a relationship when our common blood is too thin? If you had my address to ask me to dress you, you could have addressed me. Let silence dress you. I wonder who will attend your funeral since you've always been a ghost. I searched for you for years. I buried you in my soul. I won't attend a second funeral. The first one was too painful. Why are you so worried about dressing up death when you never cared about life? So I'm going to do some haikus for you guys. Haikus are really short poems, three lines five syllables, seven syllables, five syllables, a total of 17 syllables, not words, less all one syllable, to make a point. It started in Japan only in Nature and Flowers, the other countries switched it up. So it's really a non-traditional haiku or senryu, but we still call them haiku, haiku. Can't drown our problems with liquor, needles, or pills. Pain will wait for you. Haiku. How many times do you have to fall before you stop tripping yourself? Haiku. Stop asking people who can't write to define you. Your blood ain't ink. Haiku. Let's speak truth. Some of you were a virus before Corona came out. Haiku. If you won't think outside of your box, you're living in a coffin. Haiku. 
even Jesus was betrayed by one of his boys. So who's your Judas? I could. Please understand only God can take your pen. Now go pick it back up. I could. Strangers support you quicker than your own. Six cents. I see fake people. I could. Aretha taught soul lessons, but some of you did not report to class. And let's see what to end with. I could. Yes, they threw likes at your post, but they don't like you. Jealousy likes you. If you like what you heard, I have a poetry book out and I'll put all information in the chat. Thank you. Um, okay, one poem is called, I Found a Box. Let's see if you can figure out whom I'm speaking about. Today, I found a box of letters. They smell like you. Chanel number no. five tickles my nose and I inhale warm memories of your worn hand brushing strands of hair from my eyes. Today, I found a box of letters. They look like you, curving loops of grand O's and C's, holding hands like friends, leading to long tails of small Y's and G's. And I see you guiding my long hand, showing me that the pen is mightier than the sword. Today, I found a box of letters. They feel like you. The pads of my fingers rest where your fingerprints surely linger on determined linen stock and sheets of stationery, the color of daffodils and gray doves, feather to the touch. And I feel the back and forth breeze of the rocking chair where I'm cozy in the nest of your lap, wrapped in your wings. Today, I found a box of letters. They sound like you, words reflecting like mirrors, your soul and mine. History, feelings, analysis, opinions, updates, new news and old news, all of it past its prime. And if these curving loops and long tails aren't thrown in the dustbin of time, then who will translate them? to know your smell, your look, your feel, your sound, and what will survive but your thoughts out of context, a ticking unfamiliar clock. Today, I found a box. The end. You know, uh, the um, piece about walking just really hit home. Um, Paulette Garner and I have been walking and we made a list of many uh, places that would be welcoming and a uh, great place to, I heard her say 12,000 steps, but we try to get 10 and, and uh, feel good about it. So uh, we recently walked in, uh, the on the battlefield and we went over the bridge and we we walked along they've made some nice boardwalks we stopped where a man was gently fishing but one of the most wonderful parts of the uh, battlefield is because it has lots of good signage telling about the battles and uh, we're moving into the month where um, the Civil War ended. And so I decided to write this poem. Manassas, July 1861. 
In the summer of 1861, Wilmer McLean and his family lived in Manassas, Virginia. His house was on the outskirts of the battlefield. After this battle, McLean began selling sugar to the Confederate Army, but soon moved to Appomattox Courthouse, trying to avoid the fighting and Union occupation. This courthouse was still in Virginia, the center of the Confederates. And interestingly enough, they used his house to end the war. And he was often heard to say afterwards, the war began in my front yard and ended in my front parlor. April 9th, 1865. In just over one week before the final battle of Appomattox, Lee lost more than half his army. Deciding to prevent more destruction to the South and knowing that the Confederates were stretched too thinly to break through the Union lines, General Lee met with Lieutenant General Ulysses S. Grant, the leader of the Army of Northern Virginia at Wilmer McLean's house in Appomattox. At 1.30 p.m., planning to surrender, Lee, we fought the good fight. My soldiers were brave, the South we all loved, and we're trying to save is gone now. Yes, it's in a state of total ruin because of the rights we were tragically pursuing. Grant and his army now watch as we go down in defeat. Please help us go safely as we retreat, for I cannot back down from my duty and will stand like the legendary Jackson's Wall. I did my best answering this war's angry call. Grant watching Lee leave. Well, that went pretty well, I have to say. And after looking forward to this incredible day, it's time to begin repairing our land and treat our weary and wounded men, not really a time to celebrate, rather to bring back to the Union every state. I'm glad I agreed to parole Lee's men. Not taking prisoners is a way to begin the repairing of unity, so needed it's clear, and live to see equality the coming years. And then this morning, I was so glad uh, to wake up to the beautiful weather. March 26, sunrise, 7.01. Oh, there you are. I've been waiting since five, trying to be glad that I'm still alive. After hours of nightmares, such creepy sleep, you're splashing, splashing the horizon, rising from the east, a warming smile to begin my day, blessed in Kohat shining rays. Warm days are trying to be here. Doppler radar says they're pretty near, but you brought spring to me today. It's a lovely and a poignant way, a steady breeze, no clouds at all. Keep it up, Orb. Please do not stall. We need you. Brighten our coming days. Bless us. Heal us with your pleasing rays. Those are my poems tonight, John. Okay, um, I I read last about a month ago chapter one from my uh, detective police procedure novel In Pursuit, which oh, I, yeah. I published under the pen name of Brett Alexander, and I've been asked to read the next chapter. So this chapter isn't as exciting. It's uh, a lot of uh, context setting as the, um, the first chapter was just sort of introducing the dead body. Okay, here, and it's uh, about 10 pages, but I'm only gonna read the first few, so I don't, won't take up too much time, we'll continue another time. Okay, chapter two. By the time Sebastian Quintain had arrived, the car with the dead body was roped off as a crime scene. Homicide was Detective Quintain's bailiwick. It was his responsibility to find out how the woman had died and if anything untoward was involved. Just because the interior of the vehicle was splattered with blood didn't mean there was necessarily any mischief afoot. 
Sebastian Quintain was not your typical local gumshoe. As a matter of fact, there's nothing typical or gumshoe about him. For one thing, as a supervisory detective in the homicide division of the city police, he was much too high ranking to ever be tagged as a gumshoe. For another, he was elegant, pure and simple, not a typical epithet for a cop. As the beneficiary of a modest trust fund from his maternal grandmother, Sebastian could indulge his taste for such things as classically designed custom made suits, add to the elegance of his six foot one appearance, a self-assured air, which some mistook for conceit, and a disarming grace in his manner, you could easily understand how he reeked of an aura that caused many a woman to literally swoon on first encounters. He often thought his investment in custom made suits was well worth the expense because they helped him disarm, figuratively speaking, or sometimes literally speaking, female antagonists at least. And while he could not disarm male antagonists just with his appearance, his general confidence and social polish often left them startled long enough to cough up the truth before they could gather their own wits about them. And while his height was significant, it isn't what made him stand out in his job. He was a bloody genius when it came to solving homicides. You would think that his success would generate resentment or jealousy or even hostility from the other detectives in the division, but his easygoing and unassuming disposition and his almost self-deprecating demeanor made him demure any notoriety from his successes. He was always giving the credit to those who really do the hard work. For him, it was enough to solve the puzzle and prevent people who did dastardly deeds from getting to enjoy any benefits derived from their criminal behavior. Put more simply, getting the bastards who did this was what he cared about most. And every success filled this cup of satisfaction to overflowing. Sebastian lived in a four-story stalwart row house adorned with a granite stone front, having been built in the early 1900s. Though 37 years of age, he was still a bachelor and that suited him just fine. Needless to say, he was a delectable candy centerpiece among the women of his acquaintance. Deep chestnut hair, wavy but elegantly trimmed that threatened a bit of unruliness while never carrying through with its threat, framed a squarish but sculpted face. Fine bones was how the matrons in his family described his features. Women in general, however, simply sighed, their faces filled with a dreamy look that hinted their knees were likely to fold like jelly if he ever glanced their way for more than three seconds with or without a smile. It must have had something to do with the mischievous glint that perpetually seemed to ooze from his hazel brown eyes. Detective Quintain looked through the driver's window at the body, wondering what in the world a young woman, casually dressed, was doing sitting dead in a car on a quiet street along the edge of a community park, with apparently her brains scattered throughout the interior of the vehicle. She looked like she should have been in the stands cheering on one of the boys on the baseball teams, whose game she had rudely interrupted. Her head, or what was left of it, that is, was leaning back against the seat while her body leaned towards the passenger seat beside her. She looked to be in her 20s, probably early 20s rather than later. What have we got, Ava? Sebastian asked his medical examiner who was on the passenger side of the car holding a wallet in her hand. Katie Malinowski, 22, she read. Then lifting her head to look at Sebastian, she added, gunshot to the head from under the chin through and through out through the roof of the car. And Quinn, she's military. Military? Mm-hmm, she's assigned to the 22nd Reserve Unit at Bakersfield. Sebastian turned to his colleague, Detective Anthony Crenshaw, who was busy marking possible items of evidence around the crime scene. Tony, we better notify the base commander as a courtesy. Tell him we're happy to cooperate with whatever their investigators need to do for their own purposes. Will do, but remember, it's our jurisdiction, Sebastian emphasized. While he respected those who served in the military and their jurisdiction over matters military, he was not about to relinquish his responsibility to his own civilian community. The death was located in a city neighborhood, not on the military base, and that meant extensive exploring of civilian areas. Sure thing, Q. I've got a couple of uniforms canvassing the neighbors now in case anyone saw or heard anything, Tony informed him. Thanks, Tony. And turning back to the medical examiner, Sebastian asked, are you thinking suicide, Ava? Well, 
That's certainly the first impression, isn't it? But why would such a sweet looking young thing want to end her own life? A life that was obviously all too short. Having been a medical examiner for nearly 20 years, Ava had seen most of the horrors that death had to offer, but not everything made sense. That's the key question, isn't it, Ava? Sebastian observed ruefully. What is, she asked. Why would she want to end her own life or did someone else want to end it for her? If he investigated a million suicides, Detective Quintain would never become so jaded to death that he could understand why anyone would want to end their own lives. He understood despair. He understood devastation. He understood unbearable pain, both physical and emotional. And he understood how someone could reach a point in their life where all hope might have disappeared. Most of these tribulations he had experienced himself at one time or another, despite his even-tempered, dapper demeanor. But for him, the depths of despair meant when you found yourself up against the wall, you had to look your demons boldly in the face and decide how you would send them on their way rather than decide to deprive yourself of the only life you would ever have. And I'll stop there and pick, pick up the rest of the chapter next time. I have three poems tonight. The first one is about my two cats. The top cat, black cat is Miss Kaya and she is an affable cat. The bottom cat, the gray cat, is Miss Amber, and she's queenly. What I've done is take their two different personalities and put it into one persona called Little Angel. Watches by door to go outside. Muse say, please care for me. Lounges on deck, airs spread out wide. Purrs say, I'm welcome here. Climbs onto roof, but can't get down. Muse say, please care for me. Goes for a walk, tail raised up high. Purrs say, I'm welcomed here. Catches critters, brings them inside. Muse say, please care for me. Flops on backside with outstretched paws. Purrs say, I'm welcomed here. Runs into house like tail on fire. Muse say, please care for me. Darts across room, chasing ghost dots. Purrs say, I'm welcomed here. Pitches a fit, hiss and arch back. Muse say, please care for me. Sleeps all day long, eats meat du jour. Purrs say, I'm welcomed here. Muse and purrs say, please play with me. Purrs and muse say, I'm staying here. Likes to wrestle with shoelaces. Purrs say, I'm welcome here. Jumps into lap to get petted. Muse say, please care for me. Grooms body parts, licks all over. Purrs say, I'm welcomed here. Creates fur balls, expelled later. Muse say, please care for me. Looks out window, bright sentinel. Purrs say, I'm welcome here. Stares in mirror, so curious. Muse say, please care for me. Poses upright as a statue. Purrs say, I'm welcome here. Huddles snugly, a furry swirl. Muse say, please care for me. Joins friends at night, settles right down. Purrs say, I'm welcome here. Guards foot of bed, staying alert. Muse say, please care for me. Purrs and muse say, I'm nesting here. Muse and purrs say, please caress me. Frisky, friendly, loyal, little angel. Okay? Okay. The next two poems are about heaven. The first poem is one I wrote a few years ago, thinking what kind of baggage will we take to our to heaven when we go there. It's called Child of God. I am a child of God. I am passing in time, a child come from another, of God, a combined plan. Nature invites us to sift our brains. Sometimes I wonder when I detect in my mind 
Why is faring physical and temporal? How will we be in heaven as on earth? Lifetime urges us to track our genes. Sometimes I wonder when I reflect on my kin, why is bearing traceable and passable? How yeah. might we batch in heaven as on earth? Behind the problem in my case. Binding rouses us to nest our hearts. Sometimes I wonder when I connect for my God, why is caring dutiful and delightful? How can we tend in heaven as on earth? I am a child of God. I am passing in time, a child come from another, of God, a combined plan. The last poem is also about heaven. I was, I wrote this a few weeks ago when I was thinking about that, that saying from Genesis, um, you are dust and into dust you shall go. So I thought maybe our souls, when they go into heaven, become dust particles. So here it is called thereabouts. Heaven as a cloud containing remnants of life as dust particles. Oh, by the way, this is a haiku collection. Each one of these uh, segments is a haiku poem. Heaven as a cloud containing remnants of life as dust particles. Love sparks through the cloud, all nations, creeds, and races all ages and sex, God as abundance, spreading perpetuation for respiration, angels as crystals, providing inspiration for awesome thinking, Jesus as fisher, casting determination for reparation, saints as signals, comprising attestation for winsome linking, spirit as lighthouse, posing manifestation for our navigation. Heaven is aloft, the place with a state of mind, accommodation, sizing afterlife, prized by so on relations, consolidation. All right, I've got three poems. The first one I've got is called Drowning in Poetry. A poem of longing, a poem of remembrance, a poem of rage, a poem of hope, a poem to slip into your mind, a poem to never forget the story, a poem to purge the feelings, a poem of healing. Do you ever get the feeling we're drowning in poetry, day by day, inundated by poetry? Everywhere you go, another platform, another social network for poets. Countless poets lost among the broken hearts with stories that rip deep into us. Events and notifications pop up constantly. Do this, do that, see here, listen there. Read and absorb all the talented forms and poets that you can. I sift through multiple journals and sites in all to submit your best work. Yet when does one have time to create when trying to keep up? It's in these moments where it feels best to retreat and figure out which, which method works best for me. Dab a little in others' works, write a few lines here and there, listen to a poem or two, join in an online reading and network when it feels right. In true poetic form, the gatherings and discoveries excite and inspire. Part of having a poetic life is that poetry will always be there when you need it. And yet there's opportunity to take a break and resume again when it's convenient. It's poetry. It's not going anywhere. Thank you. Um, the next one I have is called Listen to Her. Inside of you, that constant voice knows you better than anyone else. She's been there when no one else was. She knows she'll never steer you wrong. She'll direct you forward and retract you from uncomfortable situations. No matter if they say otherwise, listen to her. Friends know a side of you, your lover knows another, but she knows all of you, all of your inner workings, shaping your heart and points of view. Listen to her. When the night is still, when you're in the midst of looking across the room, but you're 3,000 miles away, 
listen to her. She's there to keep you grounded yet dreaming, enjoying yet wishing that soon all will be right. Thank you. And the last one is a new one called The Other Morning. Lying in bed after a night's sleep, I peek at the clock to confirm the hour before the sun comes up. It's too early to stir the house awake, too early to reach for the phone for those good morning kisses. It's the only thing I want to wake up to, seeing you across from me, telling me you love me. Forcing myself back to sleep, I float in and out of a dream, eager to get too deep. It's one of those days, like every other one, where you are so far away and I need your face in front of me. I need your kisses all over me. I need your smile, your body wrapped around me. Yet here we are with one more night ending to one more morning and another light. And that's it. Thank you. It's called Dead Poetry Venue. Wander off the trail. Bring out the barrels. Break open the veins of poetry. Tap the essence of Dionysus. Here at the darkling moon, they gathered in small groups. I, the guest poet, was told I could not yet read. Come back. Only the dead read here. But stay for the night. Shakespeare's reading, said the host. Oh, God, not the sonnets, moaned the audience. We get together here at the darkling moon for a real poet slam. First up, head to head, Emily Jane Bronte against Emily Dickinson. A poetry storm in, is slamming, but the sheer volume of Emily D overwhelms Bronte. Then come the sonneteers. I watch as Shakespeare, considered to be too egotistical by his peers, faces off against Plutarch and Dante. Poe and Blake do a team slam, slicing the chill air with words colder than the room. To lighten up the room, E.E. E. Cummings, Mother Goose, and Ogden Nash follow with a montage of mirth. Last up, Walt Whitman and Robert Browning bring the poets to their feet. But my, oh my, the time penalties they accrue. At the venue's funeral buyer, peeking through the curtains of the two worlds, ready to slam with the group, but not just yet. There is no easy path to the slam contest, targeting an audience, live or dead, to dance with the ghosts of poets, down for the final count. Who will read my poetry? Will I read here at the darkling moon? And poets like, are poets like Egyptians, alive after death, only as long as their name and my poetry is read. Thank you. Hello. Um, so I don't have anything new, but I remembered that um, I, I entered a poetry thing when I was like 12 and I have a copy of a poem I wrote a long time ago. So this poem is called Peace. A glowing disc in the sky, smiling on my face with a yellow greenish glow, shining is the moon. Its light illuminating empty branches in the silence of the night, I spy the leafless trees, dark branches. A speckled blanket like spattered paint all around in an infinite sky, I see a range of colorful stars. A calm and restful night, soon to fall with sleep, peace should come along with night. Peace. Okay. Um, I must apologize. I don't think my poetry is up to the level of most of you. I think I write good children's stories maybe better, but I want to keep trying. Um, the first poem is called Nature Talks. Meandering outdoors on a splendid spring day, I realized just how much nature has to say. Spring bulbs planted nearby will come alive in May. Trees are just beginning to grow their colorful leaves. Nature, unlike man, does not deceive. My next one is 
it sounds like one of my fourth graders wrote it, but I did. A friendly conversation with a bird. Walking in the woods one day, I could have sworn I heard a bird say, come on this way and you will see me in a tree. I hesitated and then walked where I could see. Yes, there was a tiny bird in the tree. He explained, I am lonely and would like for you to live with me. Astonished, I looked high above. I could see a small brownish bird looking right at me. I said, I cannot live in a tree. He chirped and said, you will learn to like me. Goodness, I thought, can't you see? I cannot, this cannot be. I said, here is what I will do. Every day, I promise to come see you. The bird cocked his head and said, okay, but come before I go to bed. I replied, I promise, I will do just what I said. This one is personal and um, I am, uh, it just is very hard, so bear with me. I must be brave. This body of mine is not so fine. It is all about the spine. Serious business though. I admit I often feel low. I want to teach again. Maybe someone could find some children to send me. I miss that feeling of success and often tried not to settle for anything less. While teaching, I did something worthwhile and actually made a lot of kids smile. Oh my goodness, thank you guys. We are Spilled Ink, I can't do it without you guys. It's been absolutely a joyous uh, Friday to kick off spring break week. You made my day, I love seeing faces and I love hearing the chatter. And uh, you guys be safe out there if you're traveling and uh, We'll see you in two weeks.